now is Girlfriends Getaway. It's the second feature film that I've worked on with an amazing team. The first one was Home Again, and that was with a Canadian team. That was a feature film, Entertainment One movie. This one is Girlfriends Getaway. It's a TV One a US movie. It's really for television, but I am very passionate about bringing ourselves to the big screen here in Trinidad and Tobago. So I decided that I wanted it to show in, to do a theatrical re release in Trinidad and Tobago. So it's on um, Movie Town, Trin City, uh, Cinemas 8, Movie Town, Tobago, Chaguanas, and Port of Spain, as well as Empire in San Fernando. So, you know, everyone gets an opportunity to see it. Girlfriends Getaway is a story that's set in Trinidad and Tobago. The last time, you know, everyone's like, why are we doubling for Jamaica? So this time, it's actually based in Trinidad. It's, it was written for any destination, um, but it speaks to four beautiful black American girls who decide to take this getaway to, um, to a Caribbean destination, Trinidad. And the lead, Vicky, she owns her own real estate company. And um, she comes here for a conference, a one-day conference, a five-day conference, but she speaks for one day, so the rest of the time, the girls get away. And when they reach Trinidad, well, you know, as we say, all hell break loose. Uh, the only Americans in this movie are the four leads, and the rest of the cast are all Trinidad and Tobago nationals. So it's a blended cast and crew, and you get to see a lot of Trinidad on screen. I say Trinidad because although we took them across to Tobago to relax, we didn't actually film there. Unfortunately, you know, I'd love to film in Tobago as well. Uh, so it's, it's a blend between hangover, sex in the city, you know, it's a template that is, has been successful in Hollywood and now it's uh, rather than using four guys, it's about the girls. It's a girls' time. The idea of bringing in crews to Trinidad and Tobago, that's something that I think will work, especially if we go the route of a blended crew. So I always go back to home again, because to me that was the ideal. We had the Canadian production company wanting to shoot in Trinidad, but also because of the rebate that Trinidad offers. Trinidad and Tobago has one of the most attractive rebates uh, right now in the world. It's up to 55%, and I mean in the world, because when we go to LA and to New York and so on, people can't believe that we're actually giving up to 55% cash um, rebate. So that's one thing that brings the crews here. It's a tiered system. So for example, if they spend a million US cash, then they get 35% cash back. So they'll get 350,000 more of qualifying spend and it must be spent on Trinidad and Tobago nationals and businesses and to qualify. So they get up to 35% on the production and then an additional 20% if they hire local crew and cast So on people. So that's an, a phenomenon and it's cash, it's not a tax uh, credit or anything, it's actually cash in hand. So it's very attractive. But the thing about it is when they come and they spend a million US dollars or two million US dollars, that money it um, goes through the economy. It spends on much more than just the cast and the crew. You know, you have the trucks, the police, the locations, catering, you know, the carpenters, the drivers, the telephony, internet. We have to rent office space. We have to rent trailers, you know, so it, it really permeates throughout the entire country. So it's, it's, it's a large amount of money in a small amount of time and going very deep throughout the, the economy and the country. So the process of bringing them to here. Um, Roger Bob, as many people know by now, was Tyler Perry. He, has, he was the executive vice president of Tyler Perry Studios for most of Tyler Perry's productions. He was responsible for 11 of um, Tyler Perry's box office hits. So in 2011, he formed Bobcat Films and he went out on his own. And um, Sharice Moyes, who was one of my what shall I say, um, my many mentees <laughs> started me when she was about 16 and now she's out there doing her thing and she has been our US-based producer for a while. Um, a lot of stuff that we do in the US, she's been our US-based producer. And she, she kept saying, uh, Lisa, I want you to meet Roger because both of you are so alike, you know, you think alike and you did home again and I know that he's gonna have something to do in Trinidad and I really want you guys to meet. So we kept missing each other. And earlier this year, 2014, in, um, in March, 
Carla Fodringham, who is the CEO of the Trinidad Tobago Film Company, and I went to the locations fair to, you know, to pitch Trinidad as a location. So Carla happened to be in LA, I was in LA, and Roger was in LA at the same time. So we met, we sat, and he said, you know, I'm, I want to do a movie in Trinidad. I have this script for the Caribbean. It was I originally written maybe the Bahamas in mind because he had done Why Did I Get Married and Why, Why Did I Get Married too? for Tyler Perry in the Bahamas. He was familiar with the Bahamas. So we're like, no, you have to come to Trinidad. What do you mean the Bahamas? So he's like, yeah, but what does Trinidad have to offer? We said, we have a rebate. He's like, oh, yeah, well, that sounds good. So, you know, we got our foot in the door there. And then he started to tell me the story, and it sounded like a sun, sea, and sand type of story. I was like, hmm, that's the big. He said, no, i got to shoot in Trinidad. Trinidad, oh, my God, you know, the budget. It's not a big budget. Like, oh, my God. It's like, okay. So he, um, he said, you know what? Come and see. For yourself, because I don't want to sell Trinidad as San Sea and Sun, knowing that that's not, you know, Trinidad's a cultural adventure type of, you know, energetic, vibrancy, business, tourism, so many different things, but not that San Sea and Sun. So he came in April. So we met in March, eh? He came in April. He said, When do you want to shoot this movie next year? He's like, No, in six weeks' time. We're like, What? But, you know, I'm the type of say, Okay, and then I'll run to my team. Lesion, <laughs> Shandy, Denise, Adama, and say, okay, we have to make this work. So he did come in April to do a location scout with his team. And when they came, um, they said, um, you know, wow, we didn't realize it was like this. How are we going to make it work? That's when Castigas, who is the writer, and I, we started to talk about how we can change the script and make it a, a true Trinidad, a reflection of, make it a true reflection of what um, Trinidad and Tobago is all about. So they had the story of her coming here just on a vacation to relax. And I said, you know, she owns a real estate company. Trinidad and Tobago is known for, you know, business tourism. It's very, very credible that she can be coming here for a conference and then bring her colleagues with her. And then um, they had a basketball game, and I'm like, yeah, we do basketball here, but you know, cricket is our thing. And we can get one of our cricketing stars, so Darren Ganga is in there doing a cameo. And they would, there were other scenes that, you know, the crayfish eating competition became the doubles eating competition, you know, to make it more Trinidad and Tobago, and Destra Garcia is there doing a cameo, and the music was changed, and you have all the Tunji's music in there. So it was really a process of, and it was beautiful to see how Cass, so creative can take the information and then just switch the script in a matter of maybe a week or so. She sent back a new script with Trinidad and Tobago being presented in the movie. And that's how it happened. Well, interestingly, as you say, I grew up in television and, um, you know, up to now, people still call me Little Lisa. <laughs> you know, like, I know you since you're small in your uniform with your two ribbons. And I literally did grow up in people's living rooms and so on. And I do feel a part of Trinidad and Tobago, and Trinidad and Tobago is really part of me. Um, because, you know, I see people and they see me and they want to embrace and hug as if, you know, we're family. And it, that's the feeling you get, because from Ricky Tiki when I was like six years old, and um, Party Time, and E-Zone, and Community Dateline, and TNT This Morning, it literally was from six years old until now, always on some kind of, some form of television, whether it was television, as well as radio and writing press. But I, um, I know I like TV and I, I like both sides, producing and in front of the camera. But you know, you grew up in a time in Trinidad, um, now film is like the big thing, everybody's so excited about it. But then it was seen as a hobby. You can really um, decide that you wanted a career in film and television. That was not taken seriously. So I had to go the route of university, you know, and do the corporate thing and get my first degree and my master's and still do. And there are still some friends and family who think, why are you in this TV thing? You know, you need to be in a real job or doing something um, that's more, I don't know. You know, we still have that um, thinking, but I think it's shifting now. So many people are getting into television and film and it is a legitimate and a thriving industry. So to answer your question about whether I knew this was the next step, I think I always knew inside that I wanted to do something on my own. I wanted to have my own business. But for a little while, I was tinkering with, you know, the marketing consultancy and human resource management and 
the whole management side. But um, but I couldn't hide. <laughs> so um, yes, yeah, since 2000, in 98, I launched out on my own business. But from since 2000, when we premiered E-Zone TV show, um, till now, it was really a case of, okay, I know I want to operate on the global level. I knew that Trinidad and Tobago was the starting point, but we always saw ourselves as Trinidad based, globally present. So E-Zone was a Trinidad and Tobago project, but I don't know if you remember, with the E-Zone, we were all over. We were in Germany, we were in London, we were in Canada. I always knew I didn't want to just be about parties in Trinidad. I wanted to look at um, the diaspora and its presence worldwide and bring that to a global setting. And I think it resonated because in 2006, BET licensed E-Zone to run on BTG and BET. So, you know, that was like, wow, this is great. And I, I'd be walking through New York and be saying, oh, I know you, you do the Caribbean thing. I'm so glad, I'm so happy to see it. Some American accent, some Caribbean accent. So, you know, it was, that to me meant that we were hitting, hitting a spot that needed, that people wanted to see themselves. The diaspora is hungry. To see themselves so that was um, you know that was important and then from Izun I met with Sheldon Felix in, two, in 2004 four years later and he's like a whiz kid you know in terms of editing and director of photography and so on and that took us to another level in terms of production and we started doing the music videos all the show in Winchester series Dead or Alive and Don't Stop and all of that and so you know, it was okay. Now we're doing videos, which is like a, a launching career. If you go to all the directors' um, reels, you realize many of them start with music videos because that's where you get to experiment, you know, and try things that you you probably wouldn't get to do at that level when you're now starting off. And so we did the music video thing, and and then we got into more TV shows and advertisements and corporate features and videos until 2011 when we did um, Forward Home, which was the 50 minute documentary that we shot in nine countries, looking at the contribution of Caribbean people living in global cities back to their home countries. So we shot in Suriname, in Holland, in London, in Jamaica, in Toronto, in Guyana, in Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, and New York, yes. And we did that in we shot all of that like in six weeks. <laughs> so at the end, I'm like <laughs> completely knocked out. But you know what? I love this. I tell people, this is not a job. This is a lifestyle. So, you know, you do all these things and you're on the run all the time. But, you know, at the end, you really feel um, fulfilled. And, um, and the other fulfilling um, experience was the Cut Music Awards. Once again, the, um, the CEO of Cut at the time, Alison Lima, said, Lisa, you guys do these amazing videos and so on, but do you think you can do a Grammy-style um, award show? And of course, yes, of course we can. <laughs> Always say yes and then figure it out. And um, so they arranged for me to go to the Junos in Toronto to, to, um, to audit the Junos. I, sat, I was there for about eight days behind the scenes, you know, just working with the production company and seeing how it's done. And the Junos is like the Grammys of Canada. And it was fabulous, you know, fabulous to be there on this set. And I just said, you know what, I'm gonna do this in Trinidad. So I pulled together, now when I say I don't mean me alone, I always have a fabulous team of people working with me, very talented people. And we came back to Trinidad and we sat down and we said, okay, we're gonna do the same thing. You know, we're gonna manage the red carpet. We had a gold carpet and a black carpet, we had, did it two years. You know, we're gonna have the limousines and we're gonna have the, the whole infrastructure. So when you enter Queens Hall, you think, wow, am I in Radio City? And people were watching it outside of Trinidad and asking, what is this? And then they saw Marshall and Destra and Ryzen and Russell Leons and they're like, oh, this is something from Trinidad, let me watch. And that is what I always want, you know, that we could stand up next to whatever you see on cable television and people are, they, they're not thinking, ah, oh, that's a local, uh, you know, they watch it and they say, wow, we could do that? Yeah, we could do that. That's what I want. So. Well, to be honest, eh, when, when I was on TV, there was one TV station, TTT. It was good, everybody had to watch me. But look at today, we have three TV stations, we have the internet, 
you know, we have people can do webisodes and so on. Um, and also, there were, I think, two production houses operating. So it started to grow. But now you have people doing productions, you know, myriad productions, and getting access. That was the other thing. You didn't have access to, there were some, um, all these ads that people are getting to do. It was just a few people getting. So the market may be small. It will always be small because we're a small country. So we're dealing with small figures anyway. But I think there are more opportunities for uh, more independent producers to get into the action from more creative ways. The thing is, I would say that I created my market. Ezone didn't exist. None of the products that we did, except maybe Forward Home, where they approached us, usually when we first started, we created our products. We created Ezone. We created a television show called Bon Marge with Deborah Sadi and Emma TV, where she went into people's kitchens and did mystery cooking, and we did it throughout the islands, and we did it for about two, three series, um, seasons. Yeah, we created a show called um, Urban Rides. That didn't last too long, but, <laughs> but we still created that. So we were in that mode of let's come up with ideas that we can create our own. We did something called Mixology, Mix It Minute. Uh, you know, so we had, and that was our webisode, a web series. So we used to be creating, we created Ultimax TV that lasted two seasons um, at that time because I think we were ahead of our time. That was long before all these internet um, TV stations and so on. We were ahead of our time. People in London could sit and watch Carnival being broadcasted and so on. And um, we created a whole series of online programming, 2007, 2008, around that time. And I think the, the Trinidad market at that time was like, what's this? Nobody's going to watch TV on the internet, you know. And now look at this. I mean, this program is on the internet. So, and sometimes you go into something and it doesn't work. And then you come back at it again. You know, you, you can't get disheartened. So my thing to the local producers is, you know, come up with eZone. I think eZone created the opportunity for all of this because it was on long before all the entertainment programs that are on right now. And what we did was we partnered with, um, we found ways to provide value to corporate sponsors. So we were able to work our way through in that terms of airlines, accommodation, you know, that sort of thing. And also, um, I am seeing a number of young producers coming up with very creative programming that you have to stay the course. For the first two, three years of eZone, nobody was taking us on, but we did our thing. We still did it, you know? And, and now that you have the internet, you can create webisodes and build up that traction. And once you get that attention online, then you probably would start getting interest. Santana, for example. I think Santana was online for a while before it became you know, the phenomenon that it is now. So keep, you know, the, what I would like to tell some of the young producers is this is not an overnight thing. What they see now is not something that just happened, you know, yesterday. It's consistent quality work and being persistent in the industry. That is what will get you to your destination. I hold my reputation and my um, integrity is paramount you know i always say there isn't any amount of money to make me deter from that you know reputation before riches because i think all you have in this life is your name and people will work with you based on your name and your integrity and there's no compromising in that none absolutely none so that is my to my core i believe in that and i would stand by that and i would go bankrupt <laughs> if it means that I preserve my integrity and my name. So that's one. And the other is really to, um, to build, to help people, to, to help those around you to achieve their potential. I think that is my dharma, if you want to call it that, my purpose in life, um, to really help those around me let us all achieve together i can't achieve on my own everybody around me we all have to we all have to be in the light we all have to celebrate we all have to to be winners i can't win on my own and i can't be involved with people who think that you know they need to win and they need to win at all costs and i can't i can't do it i really can't do it so I, I keep people around me who are positive and full of energy and, 
and uh, and we all going in this together and we can't be cutting down each other and I can't uh, I don't even know how to deal with that to be honest I was just like oh. I just like pass out I can't I'll sleep all day I can't I don't know how some people do it I don't know how they get the energy to do all that so you know this is me this is what you see and I wear my emotions on my sleeve so what you see is what you get and you know honesty and integrity that is that's my philosophy and you know what smile so you could remain young forever. <laughs> um, yeah. If you were to say um, Lisa Wickham is... Gorgeous. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Lisa Wickham is... Truth. I don't believe in worse times. They are all gone. It's only the best from now on. I don't want to talk about anything bad or worse. Uh, what was the best time? I've had many best times. Caught Music Awards. Because it was the first time that we actually done something so grand. And so us. People always say, why turn that shows shows kind of like it? And like that. And then you did it. Yes. Yeah. And it was really... That is something, you know, we, Sheldon and I share. In that Trinidad and Tobago can look... We can be, we can, we can be excellence, and we'll throw everything we have to make sure we can do that. And Cot was the first time we had actually done something that says yes, we could stand up. And you know, just knowing that it was all from in us, it was we weren't partnering anybody from the US. I mean, we love our US people and we love our Canadian people. And we love the European team; they're all great. But at the end of the day, when you do that, there's no separation. You know, it could always be oh, because you were working with the foreigners, but Cot was 100% training with all us. And it was the first time, you know, so that to me was whew, amazing. But there have been so many other best moments. And you know what? I live every day to make sure every day is a best moment. So even if, not to say I'm always up, you'll say, what's she on, boy? But <laughs> it's not a case of that. It's, it's a case that I've, I'm now in a space where I live each moment. So even if I'm feeling a little down, I tell myself, this is going to be transient, it will change. And I also believe in the philosophy that there is no room for any negativity in your life. So even if you're thinking a little negative, push it aside and keep you know, positive thoughts. So when you do that, your whole world changes. And suddenly you're always in the joy of life. You're always experiencing something beautiful. So even if you are dealing with somebody who's like, oh, I could, you know, you don't, you don't see it. Yeah. And then you get rid of negative people, negative um, experiences in your life. And things only get meaning when we attach meaning to it, right? So if somebody tells you something that you, oh, I'm offended by, it's only because you make it offensive, right? But if it is that it has no meaning to you, you just move on and you go on to your next. And you don't spend time dwelling on all these inconsequential things. And I'll tell you what, it keeps you lighter, it keeps you happier keeps you fresh. Well, my mom was a principal, so I think she still is. <laughs> Strict. Um, my dad passed, so she was a single mother. And, um, but one thing though, she said, um, she never gave us presents, my brother and myself. And my mom is, I come from a very academic family, you know, people who win scholarship, national scholarship, it's very focused. So my mom was like, you know, you guys, my brother won a national scholarship, we went to MIT, the rocket science. When I say rocket science, I mean a rocket science, it's aero astro engineering, right? My cousin won island skull. So, okay, I didn't win any scholarship, but I, I went to Warwick University. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it was that environment that education was very important, very important. Um, experiences as well as decorum you know you have to be well you know as a matter of fact this is what I'm doing now I need to be sitting like this cross your legs at the ankles <laughs> but this is more comfortable right now <laughs> so um, so you know she was very strict and um, we also grew up in Morpha which wasn't like how it is now I think there was no crime Right? Growing up in the 80s, there, there was no, what it was, stealing stuff, faulty probably. And the most challenging um, situation to deal with kids with teenage pregnancy was the biggest issue, biggest social issue. 
So I think that was my mom's biggest fear, probably. You know, you can't get pregnant in school. <laughs> there, was no, there was no murder and all these things, you know, doors. But I, I remember when burglar proof. That makes me sound, that makes me sound so old, but <laughs> I do remember when burglar proof came into Trinidad and Tobago. People left their doors open. I know some people watching this would probably think, what? Never, but it's true. And um, and so I had a really fun childhood. You know, we would go and play in the savannah till sunset during the holidays, holiday time. And um, my mom would say, you know, um, I don't believe in giving gifts, like Christmas gifts and birthday gifts. But every year, every holiday from the age of three, she would take us abroad. So from the age of three, I've been traveling to, you know, the first trip was to Grenada. I do remember that because I was bowled on the plane. <laughs> but after that, we went to Canada the next year and then the States and then to London. And I guess that's why I like to travel so much. I travel sometimes two, three times in a month. Um, but she said that for her, giving us that international experience and exposure was worth much more than any Christmas or birthday present. So she was very um, strong, you know, in terms of values. Um, that whole thing of social responsibility was also very important um, to her. So, you know, we, we really do know about taking care of others and working with the homes, the children's homes and so on. So that's how I grew up. And I, um, I also was involved in everything on the planet. Eh? <laughs> I was a scout. Well, me, I was a scout, like a boy scout, not, not a venture scout, a boy scout in primary school. Uh, when I was on Ricky Tiki, I took part in everything in school, um, sport, in like marching and so on. I just believe that young people, and this is how I grow my daughter, you need to be, you need to experience your childhood. You need to be in as many activities, extracurricular activities as possible because it makes you into a whole person and you could bring all of that into your life later on. So, you know, dance, drama, choir, um, you know, scouts, guides, all these things they add value and people say oh um that's old-fashioned you know everybody wants to do video games and so but that's how i that's how i raised my daughter you know she has no facebook no twitter well that i know of <laughs> but you know no facebook no twitter and no she has a me too phone because i think those old-fashioned values really make you get to experience your childhood until you get into your 20s and then you can start doing all the you know all the social party and the boyfriend and all that that's how i was raised how old is she? My daughter, she's 16. She just turned 16. We had a lovely day, time, sweet 16 party. You know, I'm the strict mom. I'm fun, but I'm very hardcore when it comes to, um, you know, I think children have to remain children up to a certain age. And, you know, there are certain shows they don't look at. There are certain places they're not supposed to be. I don't think a 16-year-old should be out after 10. You know, I know they have all these late parties for teenagers, but I just don't think... You, you expose the child to too many things that they're not equipped to deal with, and then it detracts from their schoolwork and what they should be focusing on. So there's time for that, and we have an understanding, and so far, so far it's okay. okay. Like, I don't look at life as, I never see a struggle. Like, I don't, there are certain words that I don't use. I don't use wish, try, hope. You know, to say if you go back, you will not hear that I said I hope. I, I never use wish, try, hope, can't, well, I wouldn't say that one. We try hope and um, struggle, oppress. I don't, I, you know, I have changed my language a few years ago to be more action oriented and positive. So if you have, and I don't have that um, gender, like, you know, people ask me, what is it like being a woman in business? But I don't see myself as a woman because I just see myself as in business. So when you don't attach meaning to those things, then it's, it doesn't exist. You know, it doesn't, it is no longer part of your frame of reference, so I can't even respond to that. So in my life, I don't see it as I'm prodding, prodding along and then there's a boom, a big shift. I see it as just going from one level to the next. Um, I think the biggest lesson is really to not take everything so seriously. Because I am a very intense person, or could be a very intense person. <laughs> I could be very demanding. I am very demanding. I'm not making apologies for that. I am very demanding. And I always want things done perfectly, otherwise I go crazy. 
But I think the biggest lesson I've learned is that life continues even if things don't happen the way I want it to in terms of perfection. Life continues. You don't die. <laughs> you know, and I used to stress about those sort of things. So it's not that I'm becoming, um, what's the word, accepting of mediocrity or so, because that will never happen. It's just that I, I think I've come to terms with it. And you know what? Coming to terms with that makes life so much easier. And things actually work out <laughs> because you're not pushing and pushing as as I probably used to before. I'm now more relaxed in terms of embracing things as they happen. And, and that allows uh, excellence to fall into place and the right people. It attracts the right people around you to make things happen. I realize that that is actually the biggest lesson because before, you know, I get on, this has to happen and I'm micromanaging and doing it myself. And then suddenly I started to just relax and say, you know, it's going to be all right. Things are going to happen. And, and then even for the premiere of Girlfriends Getaway, the right people just came to the project. And it just was an amazing premiere. You know, so I think that's the biggest lesson, to let life happen. Well, I always say that it's not, you're not poor. You're poor in spirit. You know, it's a poverty of spirit. If you have a positive spirit, you could be anywhere in any circumstance and still have an amazing life. And, and so, um, for me, that is the most important thing, you know? So I would say that I, um, I, did, I still have an amazing life, you know? And I created that life for myself because life, you let life happen, yes, but you can also create, you can also speak into action what you want and believe in it. It's a whole mind thing, it's how you think, you know? So I travel a lot, I see beautiful places, Sometimes um, I always say that if I have to sit and chat with a homeless person on the side of the road, I sit and we chat and we reason. And if I have to be in the presence of a president of some country or, you know, these movie stars that we all mix in with, and, you know, it's, it's, the, same. it's the same. Well, I regret not working out in the gym so that I will have a banging body. But I always say, God know what he was doing, you know. Because you see what this is? <laughs> and a banging body. Ladies, you don't have to watch her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would love to wear a two-piece. Mm -hmm. Never was able to. You know what was my nickname in school? What you? Kins. As in pot belly. <laughs> You have to be able to laugh at yourself, huh? So I'm comfortable now, you know, before I was like, oh my God. I still don't want you all to show my little tires, right? But I'm more comfortable. Let's just say I'm more comfortable now. But I really regret that I can't stay with the gym. I want that banging body. Yes. <laughs> well, my partner is in the business. We've been together 10 years. I wonder if you even want me to be talking about it by camera. <laughs> I think everybody knows it's Sheldon Felix, right? Uh, yeah. And how we make it work? Mm, with great difficulty. <laughs> we both have very strong personalities, right? We're both perfectionists. He's even more of a perfectionist than I am. And so, and he's very intense. I'm intense, he's more intense. You know, he's very passionate. So, um, and I think that passion comes out on screen because our work is like a child, right? And it's all beautiful. But you should hear us. I mean, those people who have worked with us, this group now, they're getting the easy part. But the early days, oh my God, it was <laughs> Because we had no, can't have like that. No, no, I don't care. The quality, no. You know, we were just going on and on. But now we've come to a point where I think there's that mutual understanding as to who the personalities are in the relationship. And I think, I think we're okay. I think so. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm actually meeting Richard Branson. And I knew I said I was going to meet him when I studied him as a case. And I'm meeting him and I'm interviewing him and he's coming to Trinidad. Yes. <laughs> I was such a Richard Branson fan because I did his case at university when I was doing my master's in England. The first case we did was the Virgin case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's when I kind of understood who this person was. And Trinidad wasn't even... We didn't really, you know, Virgin wasn't a brand here at that time. This is the 90s. 
I was like, who is this man? I mean, he's so accessible. He's so He runs his business the way I would like to run my business because I, I hadn't even started my business yet. And I said, well, if I start my business, this is what I want. I want to be accessible to my people. I want to build a fun brand. You know, I want to be innovative. I want to be pioneering. And I want to meet this man. So I did write. And I think he thought I was applying for a job. And um, I wrote and he said, vaccine, well, you know, we have a Caribbean office, so refer to them. And I was like, I don't want a job, I want to meet him. And my cousin who lives in England said, don't worry, you'll meet him. And then, of course, Ezone started in 2000. And um, Virgin came on as one of our sponsors. So that's how we used to fly to London, Europe, and so on. And then uh, my assistant at the time said, uh, she called me, I was in New York, and she said, Lisa, you have to come back now. Virgin wants us to do their fifth anniversary in Barbados. I said, um, yeah. She said, no, but I told them, the only way she's gonna come back to do this is if she gets an interview with Richard Branson. I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> I'm so excited, so I flew back, and um, I flew to Barbados, almost missed the flight, eh? oh my gosh. So then, you know, Jason Williams, GW, he was my co-host at the time, and Jason is a fan of Will Smith. I mean, he just adores him, so I'm like, Jason, you know how you get all starstruck? And, this is my chance, eh? I am going to be starstruck, you'll have to give me my moment, okay? So but when I met him, it was an easy interview, it was great, you know, he's so easy to talk to and so on. But you know what? Half an hour after, I just sat like this. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just met Richard Branson. That was that, was that moment. But since then, we inter- went on, we interviewed him again. And, by that time, you know, when you met him, interviewed him in um, Antigua, and then I invited him to come to Trinidad Carnival, and he came in 2006. And so, you know, so and I don't get asked to ask for him anymore. I, I think my purpose in life is to help people develop and grow. And one of the ways that I see it when I'm most contented is when I'm working, when I'm doing social work. So we had a program that we used to work on called Shoot to Live, which um, is shoot with cameras, not guns. It's a CSP program, and we, we worked in Ibiza, and we worked in Digo Martin North, working with the kids, the boys especially, mainly boys, um, helping them as part of a longer program that the Y did with CSP um, to help them come to terms with you know conflict management and so on. And then we came in and taught them how to do camera operating, and they did their own films. And about two years ago, one of the films showed in the film festival. And that was so amazing and rewarding because I really believe everybody has a space in this world and that's what I'm passionate about. So if I were not doing this, that's what I would be doing. And not that I'm not doing it, I'm still doing it, but I would do it full time, right? Um, but on the fun side, oh my gosh, I'd love to be a rock star. I, I'd love to be able to sing like more than, ah, you know, I can do opera, I can do, Yeah, I used to sing in the Holy Name Choir. But that is not rock star moment. You know, that is choir and you have to... I want to be, you know, like... And have thousands of people screaming and like... Who, who doesn't want that? Yes, you know, to be like Destra. My girl, Destra. You know what? I have the crowd going crazy. I used to sing in them. I sang a, I sang a chutney soca already. Seriously? Yes, I tell you, I do everything. I live life. It was called Yamaha Unity. It's a theme song of his own, actually. People didn't realize that. And um, it was a minor hit, but I didn't use my name. I was so, I was like thinking, you know, people say Lisa V. Come sing a chutney. But I should have used my name. I went by Lisa V. 90, hot 93, they played it. And I think I sold about four CDs. And <laughs> I still get all royalties from it. Because uh, it registered with God, no, it's a legitimate song. Yes, and then they mix it, they made it a dance mix and all of that. But um, I, they used to have something called Youth Fest in the Savannah. I went and I sang. I'm trying to watch me like, what are you doing on this stage? But I sing my heart out. You know, you must always put your heart into everything, eh? So I sing my heart out, man. Um, yeah, I want to sing that now, though. Go and find a copy of it. I'll give you a copy. You can play it in the background. <laughs> Chutney Soka was recorded in Kenny Phillips' studio. Mm-hmm. It was part of a rhythm. I wrote a rhythm with Lemo, an artist. He used to play with Atlantic and all of that. And um, this guy... Uh, he's a radio DJ, 
can't remember his name now. Journey. Journey the Angel had Don't Stop, Don't Stop, Insomnia, but your bottle and his food. He, he sang on that rhythm. And um, Lemo sang on it, and I did the chutney. Nobody wanted to sing my chutney song. So Kenny, Kenny Phillips said, Well, girl, sing it yourself. I don't think it had one legitimate in in word in that song. I think it was just whatever came in my head. And I sang it. But interestingly enough, we call it Yamaha Unity. And Yamaha was God the highest unity when we translated it. We just said, let's call it Yah. Because those are the words that came to my mind. You may know my ha. Say, okay, Yamaha. God the highest. So you see how things happen? Yes. So. <laughs>